Hey guys, welcome back to another video. My name is Kyle and we are watching a series of tutorials on uh, using SQLize ORM with Node.js. <clears throat> so today we're going to take a little bit of a detour from uh, kind of using SQLize, although we will use it a little bit. We'll see probably our first um, get statements and insert statements. So that's something, but we're also going to set up authentication and we're going to give a little bit more structure or talk about more structure when it comes to our app. I always like to say that you know that you really like developing when you no longer ask yourself how to code, but you start asking yourself what's the best way to go about something. Um, and you stop thinking about like the in and outs of semantics when it comes to code and you're more thinking about architecture of actual applications that's always really fun so one thing we're going to talk about right now is how i plan on structuring out the backend code so that it's actually maintainable and scalable and not riddled with bugs everywhere the first thing we're going to do is we're going to kind of break this up, our um, database schema. We're going to kind of break it up into different services. So although we won't be using a true microservice architecture, we're going to kind of use like a pseudo microservice architecture. There is going to be one part of the database that is responsible for just users and Let's see here, users. And you can actually see that I added a couple tables there, or a table and a foreign key. There's going to be one part of the database that is responsible for courses, and that is all it does. And then there's going to be one part of the database that is responsible for, for lack of a better term, content. Okay, and just in the way that there's one part of the database that's responsible for those things, there's going to be different services that are responsible for interacting with those parts of the database. So this is going to be kind of the flow of information as things go through our application. Someone is going to make an API call from the outside. We don't know where it's coming from, but they're making an API call. It'll hit our app.js file, of course, and then they're going to go through identification. So every call to this service will run through some kind of identification middleware. And the purpose of this middleware is to figure out who this person is. What do they want? What do they have access to? Okay, so the reason that we do that, let's see here, where is it, is because this is kind of the structure of uh, our, uh, our access management, or our access levels in this application. So we have our users, and we have our admins, who basically have access to everything. There's nothing an admin can't do, Although we might set up restrictions in the future so that if there are more than one admin, they can only do certain things. But for right now, admins can do anything they want. Students are kind of like a subset of users. So they can do some of the things that admins can do, but they can't do everything that an admin can do. So there are certain routes that only a student or sorry, there are certain routes that only admins can access. And then there are certain routes that students can access. So this is, this is not an uncommon type of access management where an, there's a user that can do everything. And then there's a subset of users who can only do some things. So that's what that identification middleware is going to do. It's going to identify, is this an admin? Is it a user? Or is it someone who is not actually logged in? So you could um, add an even further subset to this um, of users who aren't logged in at all. So these are users who are maybe just wandering throughout the course. I haven't actually decided whether or not I want users who aren't logged in to be able to access anything internally yet. That's something I will move on, move towards later. 
I keep finally. So once they've been identified, then they're going to hit these AP, an API gateway of sorts. And normally an API gateway for my, it sits on a server all its own. This wouldn't all sit on the exact same server. Um, but like I said, this is kind of a pseudo microservice architecture, not a true microservice architecture. So these API gateways are really just going to be files that handle different routes. But nonetheless, these are the guys who determine the direction of traffic and where everything is going. So for example, if you have a course API gateway, that means that this guy, that course API gateway is responsible for directing all the course traffic. Okay. And then finally, we have the actual services underneath. Now, the big thing about this API gateway is that these services are not allowed to communicate directly with each other. That's a big thing in microservice architecture. It's one of the like fundamental tenets of it, to my best understanding. So users cannot contact contents and cannot contact, contact courses. The only thing a user can do is send information back to the API gateway, and then maybe that has to return things here. So let's think about a typical flow. Let's say a user is logged in and they want to get a list of all of their courses. Okay, so API call comes in that says, hey, give me all of the courses. It goes to app.js and the identification middleware goes reaches into the user service, which reaches into the user DB handler which reaches into the user section of the database and says, oh, okay, this person is a student. So then that returns all the way back to the identification middleware and says, this person is a student, tag this request as a student request. Then it goes to the API gateway. And the API, the API gateway says, this is a route that belongs to content, or sorry, courses. So it routes it to this course service, which looks into the course DB handler and then looks into the course DB or database. And then it returns to this API gateway all of the courses this person is enrolled in. But we don't really want it to go back out yet because then it might have to come back in and also get the content. So let's just get the content now. So then after it gets all the courses this person is in, it reaches into the content service, which reaches into the content DB handler, which reaches in to the content database portion of our database. That returns to the API gateway with all of the content now, and we can actually return a full object or something, who knows what, that has a list of all of the courses and then has a list of all of the content inside of those courses. But the main portion of this guy or the main responsibility of this API gateway is to direct traffic as needed so that we don't have to consistently go back and forth between the front end and the back end in order to get information. Remember, we want to reduce as many touches as possible. That's how data is going to flow. So this is kind of later on down the road because I would definitely say strap in um, the process of identifying a user, creating sessions with Passport, and all of this is a long video. So this next video is probably going to be a good hour long. I could definitely see that happening, um, but let's we're going to set that up. The, I just want to say one more thing and then we'll move on to the next video. And that is that you've seen here for a second, I changed something with the database schema. Um, I added this permissions table right here. And we added to our user a permissions ID. So right now, real quick, we're going to talk about how you do this. 
because you've seen so far, you've seen all of these foreign keys all over the place, right? But I haven't really talked about how do you create foreign keys in SQLize. So let's talk about that. It's been about 10 minutes. So let's talk about that in the next video. I will see you there. So many